You know, the questions in biomimicry are, what would nature do here? But another question, just as important, is what wouldn't nature do here? It's not just nature as model, it's, it's also nature as, as measure. What would nature do here? What wouldn't nature do here? Why? Why not? Those last two questions are nature as mentor. That's how we learn how to learn from the rest of life. Life, life runs on sunlight. Life runs on current sunlight. Uh, except for um, some communities that live in the sulfur, near the sulfur vents. Um, life runs on current sunlight. We run on ancient photosynthesis and fossil fuels. Um, life, life does chemistry in water. Uh, we do chemistry in what's called organic solvents, sulfuric acids, and we don't do most of our chemistry in water. Um, uh, life, life depends on uh, local expertise. You know, life, life sees abundance everywhere, and what's abundant is golden. Um, uh, it's much better to shop right where you are and use the least amount of energy for an organism. Um, then have to travel far to get what you want. So life, life really demands that, you know, organisms know their places, you know, the opportunities and the limits that are there. Um, life relies on diversity, banks on diversity, really. Um, life rewards cooperation. Uh, that's, that's how systems you know, get, make the most of where they are and create more and more opportunities for life is by hooking up in mutualisms and symbiosis. The symbiosis is, I work with a group of biologists and we're biologists at the design table. So we actually sit with designers and engineers and architects. And when they are trying to design a new filtration device, take salt out of water, we talk about the nasal glands of seabirds and mangroves and how sea turtles move. Do not fail the fire in the mind of man The fire in the mind of man The fire in the mind of man Do not fail Fire in the mind of man, the fire in the mind of man, the fire in the mind of man. Do not fail. Our technologies are natural because we're a biological organism. Uh, so our, our cars and our B-52 bombers and our highway system, those are natural. The question is, how well adapted are they? With any, you know, life's other non-human nature, the rest of nature is always coming up with new technologies. A robin's nest is an artifact, it's a tool for living, it's a technology. Um, and it, year after year, generation after generation, natural selection looks at that artifact and says, how will the chicks fare here? You know, is, is it, if it's, if that robin's nest is made of toxic material, the chicks won't do well. And that technology will be judged to be maladapted. And so will our technologies. You know, and, and so one of the things that biomimicry, I think, might help us to do is move towards um, designs and strategies that are better adapted for life on Earth over the long haul. Now, as a species, if we can get back to um, reminding ourselves of what's best for our survival, which all species are good at, um, if we can let those messages in um, and actually feel our, at this point, our biological vulnerability, um, 
which is an emer you know we're vulnerable to something uh, it's an emergency of our own making so to wake into that and to start to feel on a cellular level wow when I drink this water from the tap it really tastes bad I mean I think our cells are screaming out um, something is wrong here something's amiss we are far from adapted we are not fitting uh, we are not living fittedly um, we are unmatched to our circumstance and if we can let that in um, as as frightening at first as that will be <laughs> it will at least allow us to respond appropriately you know and to begin to do what species do which is to become better matched to their new set of circumstances for instance there's um, the way life makes hard materials like in, incredibly hard materials like the inside of an abalone shell okay is this mother of pearl it's that iridescent stuff and it's it's twice as tough as our high-tech ceramics but what the way it's made is that um, the organism this, imagine this soft-bodied organism and it releases into the seawater proteins three-dimensional molecules that self-assemble into templates sheets that have charges on them and there's calcium and carbonate in the water and those are charged and they start to land on these landing sites and then the shell material the hard material mineralizes it it literally crystallizes out of seawater and what you wind up with is a layered material like a puff pastry of the hard mineral and then a soft protein something you know gooey and and when you know when an otter takes a rock and tries to crack into that into that shell it slides like a metal you know and it's it's the bricks are in sort of a brick wall architecture so that the crack um, stops it runs out of energy beautiful architecture incredible manufacturing and we're starting to learn how to mimic that so for instance there's a guy named Jeff Brinker at Sandia National Labs and he's figured out how to take a one pot process basically he has the liquefied beach sand you know he's got he's making glass he's making optically clear glass in layers of hard and soft and he'll dip something in this pot of of uh, the precursors of this of this of a windshield and as he pulls it out the liquid evaporates away and then the materials have they have affinities for one another that's what self-assembly is um, the molecules set up they layer out like like oil and water layers out automatically you don't have to add energy uh, it's a downhill reaction it's the most natural thing it's what it's what these molecules want to do because they have affinities for one another they jigsaw together he winds up with hundreds to thousands of layers of optically clear glass silently no heat <laughs> room temperature and seven times tougher than than our glass so imagine the fossil fuel savings um, life Life can't afford to use brute force. Um, so that's what's exciting about biomimicry. You say to yourself, um, there's existence proof that there's another way to, to do this.